way to try and reach a broad audience. So, um, and that's the purpose of tonight's lecture. Um, uh, as you saw in the, in the title and in um, the descriptions, we're trying ideally to expand um, awareness and, and, and just the dialogue around terminology involved in historic barns. Um, of course, terms are different in different places um, across our very wide and large country, uh, but, uh, but it's nice to have um, a few grounding places uh, to start. And, and so I think that's what our two speakers this evening really excel in, and we're very much looking forward um, uh, to this presentation by Jeffrey Marshall and Michael Cuba, both who are current uh, board members of the National Barn Alliance, um, but they've um, been in historic preservation and certainly um, dealing with barns for um, quite some time. Uh, I know that they've given a version of this lecture or something very close to before um, for one of uh, Preservation Pennsylvania's or, or, um, conference or a conference uh, for preservation professionals in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but of course the the barn type and and um, and all the construction and technologies and things that go into it extend way beyond that Commonwealth. Kentucky's another one I like to remember. Um, anyway, without further ado, though, I will go ahead and give it to these two gentlemen to um, make sure that our evening is short and succinct. But again, I appreciate everyone who signed up and um, and who's participating on the call. And I do hope that you'll take the time um, to share share the information and and stay with us as we continue this great lecture series. So thank you again, Jeff and Michael. Want to start, Michael, or you would like? Um, I will just start by thanking everyone for coming. I, I was expecting maybe five or six people on the call, and we're up to 81, so that's really encouraging. And I see that most of you are muted, which is much appreciated. That helps cut down on background noise. Uh, both Jeff and I really do appreciate back and forth and dialogue. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, you can type questions into the chat function uh, and you can also feel free to unmute and ask us questions uh, either during the slideshow or after if you choose. And um, I would just ask otherwise that you stay muted if you're not speaking. Jeff, go ahead. Well, thank you. And before we start, I also wanna thank everybody and um, as Danae said, this was done last year for Preservation Pennsylvania. So with all due respect to my Michigan friends, since Pennsylvania is the barn capital of the world, it is a little bit heavy on um, this region. But we hope that the uh, information we present, well, if it doesn't give you an exact term for what you're looking at, starts you asking questions. And that's what we really want to do is we really want to um, try to get a common language so that when we in the National Barn Alliance go to Michigan or Kentucky or anywhere. Um, when we call something, we all know what we're talking about. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a, uh, a situation where a lot of the Pennsylvania barns are deemed to be Pennsylvania German. So we have Pennsylvania German terms for uh, features that um, we are seeking out to find what people in the rest of the world call them. So um, a lot of this will hopefully be interactive. And at the end of the day, we will know um, a lot more than um, oh. when we started. So with that. Did they leave? I don't. Yeah. I don't. Mm. Let's see. Can I see? <laughs> Sorry, I've just gone and muted everyone. Uh, and I will see if I can unmute Jeff. Jeff, can you unmute yourself? I did. Oh, good. Very good. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw the, the screen up and we're going to try a little experiment and see if I can share the controls with Jeff. Okay. This is our background page. So we'll see if we go from here. Okay. So I believe I have given you control, Jeff. Okay. It changed. I don't know if I did it, but this is who we are. <laughs> um, so uh, at the end of this, I think there'll be some more time for contact information. Uh, so we'll see where we go from here. All right. So what we want to do is really, you know, how do you see a barn? When you look at a barn, what are you looking at? And so uh, 
we at the National Barn Alliance and their barn preservation groups throughout the country um, have a similar, I think, technique where we go, we look at them, we try to analyze how they're put together, and then functionally what were, what were each part of the barn used for, because obviously form follows function. So uh, sometimes we do uh, what we call autopsies on barns and other historic structures where we get to see them uh, in a way that uh, you get a chance to analyze what they were. This is a uh, double-decker Pennsylvania barn that has um, obviously been gutted, but once you start seeing a number of these, you start figuring out what may have been there, which is always very helpful. Uh, now we're not. All right. So um, the term barn itself is really subject to a lot of interpretation. And again, not to be a barn snob, uh, where there are carriage barns and urban barns and town barns and such. Um, we have focused, I think, speaking for Michael and myself, on the, the larger structures, uh, the ones that are multi-use structures. And these are not obviously all the uses, but these are three of the um, critical uses that um, make a rural barn a barn. So uh, that's what we are looking at. Again, no discredit to um, any other type of structure be a single use structure, like a hops barn or anything like that, but we're trying to focus on the, the broader aspects. So what we're trying to do is come up with some universal accepted terminology. Um, and as Michael and others said, different parts of the country use different terms. But in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, we have a structure that's in the front of the barn called the four bay often extended beyond the front wall. But otherwise, the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal members of the timber frame, which make up most of the barns that we deal with, um, are readily identifiable and with a little bit of uh, conversation can all be referred to in language that we all understand. Um, but, you know, there are a number of regional sites. You go to our, our website and there are some of them are listed and they will help you um, find what uh, may be the term in your uh, particular area. The other area that I use a lot when we talk about historic barns is reading National Register nominations of other barns that have been already listed. So and those are fairly easily now in the, the digital age to find and really provide a lot of clues as to um, what the proper nomenclature is on barns. And of course, a word is of advice, the warning is many of these nominations were originally um, done by, by non-barn architectural historians who often would struggle for a word and are often more descriptive of a feature than coming up with a name. And part of what we're trying to do is try to make that type of designation and uh, research on barns less onerous by providing some nomenclature. So again, there's a lot of text here. But the idea is uh, what I said earlier, that many non-barn building architectural historians substitute terms um, of their own. And, and that's better than nothing. And of course, a picture's worth a thousand words when you do barn documentation. And we, we recognize that there are other regions, despite what I said earlier, that Pennsylvania is the epicenter of barns in the world, that uh, what we say here isn't exactly the same as every place else. Uh, well, Pennsylvania barns, um, for a lot of reasons, because of the way they permeated into the mid-Atlantic region and was a cultural heart that spread to other areas as well, even into uh, Canada, uh, and because of their size, have you know probably taken a little bit unfair position in the forefront of barn terminology. The fact that they are also older than many barns in other areas and were built as vernacular structures before interchangeable parts and the Industrial Revolution makes them a little more unique trying to describe what you see. So, as, as we look at these, uh, and this is a typical Pennsylvania bank barn, and it's called a bank barn because there's an embanked uh, entry on the, on the rear of the barn uh, are the terms that we use. And now later on, Michael will have a, perhaps a comment about the term summer beam being used um, 
<clears throat> and not or not being used as the case may be to describe some of the major beams underneath a barn floor. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, over 70 years we've been studying barns and one of the first seminal books on the Pennsylvania barn is this very childish looking book but excellent source on the Pennsylvania barn from 1955. And it was by Alfred Shoemaker and in it he spoke Pennsylvania German and went out and spoke with other people who spoke that language and documented special dialect words and other terms uh, that uh, are become have become part of the common usage in Pennsylvania. Um, also made more prominent by the, the excellent work by our good friend Bob Ensminger on his book on the Pennsylvania barn, which is one of the go-to books on barn. Uh, let's see what happens now. We're stuck here. Uh oh. Uh oh. Your chance to read the Pennsylvania German. Okay. As I said, Bob Ensminger was uh, is the, the godfather of the Pennsylvania barn study, and he's come up with several different terminologies for Pennsylvania barns. And Pennsylvania is a good microcosm because these are all Pennsylvania barns. Uh, and you can see that things that came out of a, a, a Schweitzer barn, and even without the uh, English Lake District, barn or that's when you ground barns there are a multitude of variations and we see this all throughout Pennsylvania all throughout the country but for those who um, use the term Schweitzer barn when they're dealing with a barn that has a four bay and a, a bank uh, we differentiate between what is now more commonly called the a Pennsylvania standard barn and the Schweitzer barn and of course those who speak Pennsylvania German know Schweitzer is German for Swiss. So we call them German barns and the Germans call them Swiss barns. But that's, uh, again, the difference in nomenclature. And the difference for those real quickly is that the Schweitzer barn will have a salt box looking appearance as compared to a symmetrical appearance when viewed from the gable end that a open four bay Pennsylvania standard barn will have. And if you look carefully, you see that the ridge of a Schweitzer barn is centered over the foundation forming that overhang. And in the uh, Pennsylvania standard barn, the ridge is over the center of the upper floor. So those are the distinction. And uh, we read a lot of reports by people who call any bank barn with a projecting four bay a Schweitzer barn, which is uh, we're trying to get away from. Uh, again, focusing on Pennsylvania German or Dutch barns, uh, using that, that term. Uh, the, the key term that we come across, which is Vorschus or Vorbau, which is the uh, four bank. And that is the, one of the distinctive elements. There are two level bank barns in many other states, but the, the thing that sets apart the Pennsylvania barn from a, a basement farm or barn or some of the other two story barns, two level barns we see throughout the country is that projecting four bank. However, uh, we also have another whole body of um, barns in Pennsylvania that for many years was underrepresented in the literature, which is a English Lake District barn. Another two-story bank barn found in the Lake District of Northern England, uh, contemporary with uh, the smaller English barns that people think of with New England and some of the other 30 by 40 little frame barns that we see in the mid-Atlantic uh, states if there is one distinct difference between the Pennsylvania German barn with its four bay and the English Lake District barn is the stable doors are protected by a pent roof rather than a projecting four bay. And here's an example of one. And because it's always interesting to me, we have a English Lake District barn with the name of a Pennsylvania German farmer uh, emblazoned on it. So the idea that any distinct ethnic group was used one type of barn form exclusively, I think is uh, being disproved as more and more documentation is produced. So when we look at barns, again, and this is a little more, I think, universal. And so uh, some of the features that we see is on the back of the barn are the big wagon doors, 
depending on how many threshing floors or wagon bays you have, tells you how many um, sets of big wagon doors there are. Um, for years, I was a sexist, and I used to call the door within the door a man door. But I have learned that they are people doors or a door within a door, so you don't have to open the big doors to, to get uh, to the threshing floor. We also see a number of mid 19th century structures with an, an added on rear addition that was used for a horsepower. Um, so that is something we see throughout Pennsylvania. And then we also have the stable on the lower or basement level in a Pennsylvania bank barn so that you would either have doors that lead to individual stables or lead to feed aisles, which in Pennsylvania German is called a Fotterdam. But that's the type of door openings we see. Again, in Pennsylvania, uh, we have two different types of four bay barns. The one the upper right is called an extended four bay barn. Uh, we have them stoned to the square or stoned all the way into the peak or uh, different varieties. You see here the, the door that you're not supposed to walk out of in your uh, everyday activity is a granary door for loading wagons. Uh, the smaller doors on the four bay side, whether in the wall itself or on this case extended four bay, are for winnowing when wheat and grain, you know, separated from the chaff and using uh, the old fashioned way. Um, in much of southeastern Pennsylvania, we have an amalgamation of the German Schweitzer barn and the uh, English Lake District barn, which is a stone barn that has a recessed or closed stone four bay at the basement level and a frame uh, overhang above. And we in Pennsylvania have been having a, a debate on whether or not these are four bays or that, you know, is this recess a four bay? Is it a space or is four bay a structure that extends out? But we won't bore you with that. Um, barns, you know, obviously stone barns need ventilation. And we see a trend that pre glass windows, we have the earlier structures having the splayed ventilation slits. Um, for, you know, uh, not for fighting off Indians, but to um, allow for ventilation with a minimal amount of, of moisture to get into the structure. And those seem to be re replaced in the early 19th century by the advent of wooden louvers. And when you get to parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio and some of the surrounding states, uh, the louvers become ornamentations in their own right and really become uh, a signature for various barn builders or um, people who just wanted to show off their skill or their money. Uh, we are fortunate in um, our area to have uh, a day book by a barn builder from the mid 19th century. And we uh, are, I'm, I'm, we, I speak for myself. I'm sad that he didn't label anything. He knew what they were. And unfortunately today, we're not quite sure exactly what he's talking about. And we look at these um, these diagrams, and this seems to be the front of the barn, and this one over here is the perspective, I would bet, um, to show how the size of this extension was, and then whether or not it was a four bay or just a straw shed, which is a term used by non-German barn folks to describe the, the extra wooden extension on a often stone barn. And it's also called straw mount, straw room, and a lot of what I know I try to do, and others who do this, is look at 19th century newspapers, journals, um, agricultural magazines, and try to use the terminology that they use. Um, sometimes you get very lucky, and I like this one because it's a beautiful English Lake District barn, but I like it because when uh, Joseph Nash died, his sons were arguing over the estate, and one of his sons claimed he wanted to be compensated for the cost of building his barn and wagon house. So he deducted the cost of the barn from the um, money he owed his other heirs. And you see, this barn cost $600 to build in 1836. Now, this is the kind of stuff that we barn geeks live for and that is rare to find. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Stone barns are very common in Pennsylvania, somewhat in New Jersey, Ohio, and the surrounding area. And 
uh, as I said earlier, the English Lake District Farm would have had a pent roof, which is now where this drip course stands. And this is a uh, another barn, which is very similar, except this one has got the frame four bay. So this would be a closed four bar, closed four bay Pennsylvania standard barn. As I said earlier, this is where you go. Uh, the American Agriculturalist, you can Google that and uh, for a number of terms and uh, find out what these things are called. Well, um, my program is trying to update my uh, thing here, so I apologize. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the term double decker, which I always thought was a late 20th century term for uh, three level barns, was obviously um, used as early as the um, 1860s and shows uh, the floor plan of the stable area, which is also very helpful for those who want to look at barns. And whether they call the center a threshing floor or a wagon bay, um, the threshing was no longer done by hand by the mid 19th century, but that term still seems to, to carry forward. And so here, um, there's an example of, and they actually call it a, a threshing floor. Yet, it's a mid 19th century. Uh, the other thing, what what is helpful? The other thing that is helpful in old barn studies is looking for newspaper advertisements. And um, the the term uh, stone stable high is a fairly common way to describe. Um, these types of Pennsylvania bank barns. And um, a lot of these um, real estate ads are a little bit over the top, you know, the best barn in the county, that kind of stuff you expect to see from a real estate ad. And again, just another example, this is even earlier, 1837, of different sources for uh, its terminology. And so you see the term Perlins was used even back then. Uh, and all the, a lot of the terms we still use uh, today are still here. And if you, I'll let you read some of this before I go on. You, you get the height and the width, you know, overshoot instead of the four bay, uh, and some other terminology. Um, talk real quickly about log barns, which are uh, found throughout the region and are obviously rapidly disappearing. Uh, and whether or not you use the term crib or pen, we'll maybe come back and take a survey later, but those are the, the, the two ways to delineate the, the structures that go into a log barn. As I mentioned several times, uh, the term threshing floor is used a lot, and it was a central bay, in, generally a central bay in a barn, and uh, before threshing was mechanized. Uh, and so the question is, do you still Refer to, when you're writing up a story or you're writing up a description of a barn, do you still refer to the Central Bay as the threshing floor if the barn was built after the mid 19th century? Um, again, this is one of my favorite ads I found uh, because Michael and I were at this barn and it has an eroded date stone in the, in the gable, so it's extremely frustrating. But I found a newspaper ad that said it was built in 1835. And I like it because it says it's believed to be one of the largest and best constructed buildings of this kind in the county. And it was a four bay barn, F O U R, that there were two threshing floors, or in this case, thrashing floors, as they said. So we often have here is a four bay, four bay barn. Um, and so it's, um, you know, an interesting one and has conical piers uh, supporting the uh, four bay. And as I said earlier, a lot of these guys um, were really puffing their advertisements, but they did tell you um, the name for, you know, the different things, hay houses, overshoots, uh, how many how many horses were stabled in a, in a, or cows were stabled in a barn. So when you start seeing barns of similar size, you use these as comparisons to say what, you know, what kind of uh, livestock was there. And when you take these with the agricultural census of the 1850s and 60s, um, you can get a better idea either way that you know the size of the barn by how much livestock they had, or in this case, 
you can learn what the appropriate size barn for a certain amount of livestock is. Um, and this is the one of the earliest advertisements uh, I saw, and they did not call the bank a bank. They called it a road up to the second floor, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and, it, you know, and the way they say it is frame set upon the wall. It's a, it is, as I said earlier, when you have non-barn people trying to describe barns, here's a real estate salesperson trying to describe this barn uh, in 1830. So, and use the term Mao. So, um, and an interesting thing is the mouths are calculated for the mowing of grain as compared to the mowing of grain in which you would do in the field. Um, on the, uh, on many barns you have an overshoot and then you have also some frame additions that in the 19th century, uh, typically those on the back of the barn are called abutment houses which we call bank sheds or, or sheds in many cases. Um, and then one of the things, the federal, 1798 federal direct tax is a great way to document historic barns. And I only picked this page because this assessor had a sense of humor. And if you read the thing that's in the box in the upper left, it says John Adams, farmer, not president, is the person being assessed for this particular piece of property. And with a little bit of work, um, Heritage Conservancy has done a number of maps like this where we are mapping out the communities that um, correspond with the 1798 by doing deed research. And so we can document where any 18th century barns that may still exist would be located within the, these um, meets and bounds. All right, Michael, uh, I want to talk a little bit about real construction, not research. Well, it's 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 all real. It's valid. I'm amazed. I made it 39 slides without saying a peep. Um, so before we dig into some of the terminology, uh, I'll explain. Uh, I, I work as an editor for the Timber Framers Guild. They have a, a quarterly technical journal that has been published since 1985. And with that publication, uh, I've inherited a glossary that has been informed and modified and revised and, and grown for the last 35 years uh, based on best precedents of primary source materials. Uh, so uh, we do a lot of work to refine how we discuss uh, structural members because we're speaking to a national and oftentimes international audience and of course, in the United States, we have settlers coming from all over the place. And so some of our terminology does uh, it well, it really shows that our terminology is not necessarily the same as the English uh, or what you find in uh, British publications. There are certainly some some nuances and variations. And so uh, the barn that's shown drawn here, this is the, the Heckler Plains barn in Lower Salford, Pennsylvania. And it, it's got a number of components to look at. One that's somewhat unique to the area is the Ligander stool, uh, which you see all those red arrows, uh, with the exception of the one pointing to the strut, are pointing at the components of the Ligander stool, which is uh, an elaborate purlin system uh, but rather than having vertical purlin posts or purlin posts that are canted inward toward the center of the barn, uh, they're pitched out uh, and acting somewhat as upper cords of the truss. Some people call them ligander stool trusses. Um, they, they do operate as sort of a base truss, but all of those components are required to have a complete ligander stool. Uh, and you see then there are common rafters laying on the purlin plate. Uh, and then at the end, at the gable, they don't have that elaborate truss formation. They have simply uh, vertical purlin posts. Uh, in between those vertical purlin posts are the straining beams. And you see with the ligand stool, they have both a collar beam and a straining beam 
combined, usually pegged together. Uh, here, this is in the same barn. It shows uh, transom girt. Uh, the, the actual transom, I think people are used to thinking of transom windows or transom lights, but uh, the actual transom is the girt or the structural member over a doorway. Uh, we generally call whatever the rafters are landing on out of, uh, toward the eaves wall uh, a plate or a rafter plate. Some people call them top plates. They're all acceptable. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we have rather large diagonal braces in addition to the smaller knee braces. And the timbers, Jeff, you, you might uh, have some comments about those, but uh, over the threshing floor is often removable timbers uh, referred to as a scaffold, but uh, there's other vernacular or colloquialisms, at least in Pennsylvania. Yeah, we, they're often, it's often called an overden or over, over ben in Pennsylvania German, but the point is very often the um, rafters or the, the joists go uh, perpendicular to the one shown here and they could be moved out of the way um, as you needed them or as you didn't need them for additional storage uh, when your mouths become full. And there's also some conversation that when they're at a lower level than the height of the mouth, they were a staging area where you could throw hay from your hay wagon, um, or you put a floor up there temporarily to so that over then or the scaffold level and then from the scaffold into the higher hay mouths on either side. Um, it, over the past couple of years, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people uh, across the country and across the globe about terminology in roofs, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of confusion about it. Uh, there are certainly colloquialisms which may be locally acceptable, but when, when trying to communicate to a larger audience and uh, outside of the trades and trying to communicate with engineers, it, it's really been important to develop uh, a common language. And so uh, here's uh, another Pennsylvania German barn. This is up in Regalsville, Pennsylvania in Northern Bucks County. Uh, and it shows a principal rafter system with principal purlins. There, uh, instead of a, a purlin plate, which runs continuously, uh, these principal purlins tenon into principal rafters and then support common rafters on top of those. Uh, they're not shown in this slide. I think this is the, the same building. Now the, the common rafters are in place. So this is what Jeff was talking about earlier. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I realized doing work in New England and doing work in the Mid-Atlantic is that uh, the term summer beam is often used to describe uh, anything supporting a floor system that's running longitudinally. And uh, something interesting an engineer had pointed out to me recently, he said, well, if you say dropped header, I assume that it's supported by posts. And it tends to be that a summer beam is integral to the framing of the structure uh, as opposed to a drop header, which is underneath uh, and supporting. So they're, they're roughly doing the same thing, but they tend to be joined in a different way. Uh, if you think of old houses in New England, lots of them have summer beams, but you never see posts underneath of them. So that might be a good indication or a good way to think about it when you're looking at timbers in a basement of a barn. If it has posts underneath of it, more than likely it's a dropped header. Uh, this slide just identifies uh, uh, to the right, you see the word bent, which is used to describe any transverse section of framing. So that would be a section of framing that's running with the gable, um, but not necessarily including the rafters. So from the, the plate or tie beam down to the main sill level, uh, any transverse section is commonly referred to as a bent. Uh, and here you can see how uh, barns may be commonly divided out. You see a hay mow uh, with a granary in front of it, and the granary toward that wood framed eaves wall of the barn is in that four bay area. Uh, it's also 
noted that, uh, you know, if you were in New England, the framing is a little bit more sparse and it's really easy to identify the tie beam because it's the only major timber that's running uh, transverse through the barn in a, a small early barn. Uh, in many places, you've got multiple timbers in the same orientation. And it's generally considered that the uppermost timber is doing the most work to resist the outward thrust of the roof. And that timber is the tie beam and that other secondary timbers beneath it may serve other functions like uh, carrying scaffold beams and might be referred to as girts or interties. Um, girt is a popular description. It's one that uh, some timber framers are trying to get away from because technically it means to encircle. And that's not really what this timber is doing in this slide. Post in beam. Jeff, this is your slide. I will point out, it says, it says uh, post and beam. Um, generally with timber framing, uh, we, we don't use the terms interchangeably. Post and beam, most timber framers regard as something that utilizes uh, metal fasteners or connections. So you might have, uh, instead of a mortise and tenon, you might have steel plates. So most people in the trades won't use the term interchangeably. Right, and the idea, um, that's a very good point because it's a term that is used by the public more so than by people in the trades. But the basic premise to these is post is vertical and beam is horizontal. And while there are a number of each type based on their location or their function, uh, the base, that's the basic point of uh, a post versus a beam. So let's see if we can continue to move this. I see. All right, again, same thing. Oh. Oh, did you want me to go back there, Jeff? That's OK. Now, go ahead. And the same thing, where this is um, what Michael had said um, it, in terminology, again, with a lot of nuances in between from, you know, from the bottom up, you know, sill, girt, and we can talk about whether, it, you know, you know, and they should generally on the exterior of the barn, not, you know, transverse and plate as being the bottom, middle and top. And then some of the types of beams that we are used um, in terms Michael mentioned tie beam, an anchor beam is, you know, something that we see in New World Dutch barns and others, and so, there we go. So, I guess we're moving ahead. So this is, again, another thing, just showing another central Pennsylvania barn with the threshing floor or wagon bay on either side, because hay was put up loose, you have solid walls to keep the hay in, and those in the parlance are called mouse deads and hay mouth on either side. Um, as Michael also said earlier, um, the bent is the entire wood framing members that are shown on both sides of this threshing floor and bents separate buildings into bays. So as I said, this is a three bay barn. Um, so it would have these two bents and then two end bents. So it would be four bents and three bay barn. So uh, there, somebody wrote in a question. Uh, Chuck Boltman is asking about the, the scale of principal members in a barn, um, commenting that in, you know, in the Midwest, the tie beams, for example, are not at the plate heights. And this certainly, it varies throughout the country and it varies throughout time. Uh, the very earliest structures that you'll see in New England and in some places in the Mid-Atlantic will have tie beams at or above the level of the plate, in some cases with rafters landing directly on them to try to isolate the outward thrust of the roof. Uh, whereas the bigger and later barns, after you get 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the tie beams not only start dropping, uh, they start becoming segmented. Uh, and uh, Chuck, you feel free to, unmute and, 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 you know, answer whether or not that, that clarifies uh, in terms of scale. Size-wise, it really runs the gamut. Uh, you know, if you get into New York and you're looking at actual New World Dutch timber frames, you'll find anchor beams that are 20 inches deep and 10 or 12 inches wide. And if you're on the, the coast of Long Island, you'll find tie beams that are six by sixes. Um, 
So it really does vary. Does that answer your question, Chuck? Well, it wasn't as much of a question as, as much as I also wanted to make sure that those of you on the talk who have less experience in doing this is that we read the primary pieces of any given barn from basically from large to smaller. And where the large beams may be may not always be in the expected locations as Michael and um, Jeff have been outlining. So as you move around the country, you when you go into the barns, because part of this message is reading the way it's framed as opposed to just the form of the outside, is to consider the scale of the members as you start to look at their and, and try to evaluate their importance. That's all. Yeah, it is a good point and a good observation. And it, it, there's quite a degree of variation in a, a lot of reading the framing is reading the engineering and the load paths. Uh, in the photo that's on the screen right now, you can see that the, the tie beams are continuous as are the, the timbers beneath them. So they're, they're both able to sustain some tying function, depending on what the joints at the ends look like. Um, wood is not fantastic in tension. It's good, but it's not great. Uh, and as you get into bigger barns where it's really difficult to find uh, timbers that will span a very wide barn, you might find that they're they're broken up or they're, you know, they, they tenon into the sides of the post instead of having continuous tie beams. And you may find that the strategy for managing roof loads is by sending the loads down through the purlin plates directly and just having taller posts and having the loads go directly to ground. So looking at the, the, the size, the scale, and the position of framing members uh, gives you a sense of engineering schemes. They're not always good sense, but it gives you a sense of what the builder was thinking when they did it. Swing beam. And one of the other terms, beams we love to talk about, and I see it on the barn builder, so I know it's a real term now, uh, is a swing beam. And a swing beam, it may be limited to the mid-Atlantic. Um, I think it is. But basically, it is a system by which you have an open span underneath a major beam so that you can swing your team around and back out the door you came in. Uh, remember a bank barn, you don't go in the front and out the back or in the back and out the front without falling down about eight feet. So the idea that you would uh, be able to swing your uh, team around was important. Uh, when people first hear the term, they think the beam swings are disappointed to find out that they don't. Uh, this is also designed so you have more storage space on the floor for wagons or other material and still have loft space above. And you can see in this case, there, you know, there are, you can see where they're, they're, it's attached. Often these beams are cambered in that they're arched, that they're thicker in the middle than they are on either end to help, I guess, avoid deflection is the right term? Yes. Um, that, so if it's thicker in the middle than it is on the ends, it's sort of an induced camber. Uh, as opposed to, you know, camber in a, a lower truss cord where you've bent it and held it in place. It's held in tension. Um, that, uh, another detail of the swing beam, what seems to be important about them is that it essentially allows you to extend the threshing bay uh, from the, the bay area under the swing beam into the next bay. And that's something if you're looking at an early structure with a swing beam, that you can usually pick it out in the flooring. If the original threshing floor is still there, you should see that the threshing floor goes into the swing bay as well as the, the regular threshing floor. Uh, and we do have reasonably good documentation of early swing beams uh, going well up into New York. So we certainly see them all over New Jersey, uh, some in Pennsylvania and some in New York. But I would say swing beam barns are almost the, the standard in New Jersey. And as a rule of thumb, the bay that the swing beam between that's outside of the swing beam is often smaller than the other bigger hay mount bay. All right, let's sit here. And occasionally they are seen in Michigan, says Chuck. Yeah. Outliers. All right. Um, 
you mentioned some of this in the, the uh, slide that you showed earlier, Michael. Anything else you want to add to this one, or are you? No, this is tied together right now. Uh, you know, fairly standard arrangement. There, there's, um, I, I've been cautious in the context of articles about not just saying purlin because there are really three types. Um, there are common purlins which carry sheathing, um, principal purlins which span between principal rafters, and purlin plates which are the continuous full length. So uh, if if there's only one of a type in a structure that's being discussed, then I'll mention that type at the first mention and then say purlins casually thereafter. But uh, something I've seen, you know, up and down the East Coast is that in different regions, you tend to have regions that only have one type or two types. Uh, in some cases, you know, if you're really looking, you'll find that all three types appear in the same region. And the other thing, quickly point on this slide, I know we're, we're dragging here, I apologize, is this barn does not have a ridge beam. Doesn't have your um, pentagonal New England ridge beam, doesn't have a ridge board, which we often see, you know, mid 19th century, but has um, the rafters are open and then pegs, I'm sorry, open, there is a open joint and then peg. And this is another thing that uh, we see a lot of, Michael mentioned, uh, the pearl and posts we see. Uh, oh, Shenandoah Valley, oh, right. Uh, that this barn has canted pearl and posts. Uh, and often you'll see reference to these canted pearl and posts incorrectly called queen posts. And I don't know if you want to talk about that real quick. Uh, I, I will only say it very quickly. In I think part of the reason that people have called them queen posts is because in a lot of primary source UK terminology, uh, these are referred to as queen posts. But uh, the, I will say the Oxford English Dictionary cites Peter Nicholson's definition of a queen post, which specifies that it's part of a truss. And although they may be similar in appearance and location, uh, in, if it were a queen post, it would have upper cords and a straining beam and tension connections at the bottom. Whereas uh, many canted purlin posts might just have stub tenons that they're just located and sitting on the tie beam as opposed to a queen post, which would be suspended from the upper cords at its top and holding up the tie beam. They're functionally very different. Excellent. So we talked about what these are, so we can go past this one, I think. Yep. Uh, and then I, I will relate this back to, we, sh we showed a slide with the ligander stool, and before the ligander stool, this was a really common arrangement in uh, Switzerland and Germany, where rather than trying to control the outward thrust of the roof, they used multiple purlin plates and really tried to send the load directly to the ground and minimize outward thrust. I think in this structure, there's seven purlin plates. And this is a structure in Maine. And this is something that's very common uh, when you go east of the Connecticut River. If you're looking in New Hampshire and Maine, you find common purlins. So you've got principal rafters with common purlins, and the common port purlins directly support the sheathing. And the interesting here is the ridge purlin as compared to a ridge beam. Yeah, this one is a little different. It is the, the, the ridge beam, you know, it tends to be that the rafters would tenon into it. In this case, there's just a notch at the top of the rafters and the ridge purlin sets in it. Uh, so it's not offering a, any specific structural advantage in, in the same way that a, a ridge or a structural ridge would offer. And the, the terminology for major rafter, minor purlin is um, you know, similar features, call different things in different parts of the country. So, and the, the, the source here is a wonderful American author uh, who 
had cited a wonderful British author. And we had shown pictures of the one that Michael has shown the rendering. And as I said earlier, many of the, bar, the ones we see here, um, the beams go uh, parallel with the ridge or perpendicular to the, the threshing floor itself. And here's an example of, again, loose boards stacked on top. Uh, loose boards can then be moved back and forth or out, depending on what kind of uh, storage needs you have. In Pennsylvania, they're called over dens. And in other parts of the country, they're called scaffolds. And we also have a lot of conversations of people talking about a hay loft and a hay mow. Uh, and I, I quote, you know, John Michael Vlach here in his description, which seems to be a good one. Uh, the loft is above the stabling area. Uh, a mow is often on either side of the threshing floor and often go from floor to peak. So uh, a little esoteric if you have a ground barn or a two-level barn, but uh, the hay mow is um, that's a floor to ceiling often. Uh, the other term Michael had pointed out earlier in the conversation uh, on the location on a schematic is the granary, which is an enclosed area where a farmer would store grain for next year's uh, use. The idea is to have it be vermin proof, um, which it often wasn't. And um, it's interesting that as one slide said early on, there's a door for exterior access, but very often there's a window in either the four bay wall or the gable wall to provide illumination in this enclosed area without the need of a candle or a lantern. So uh, often on the outside, you can see where the granary was without even having to step inside the barn. And here's an example of one that inside the granary, uh, there's actually a slot, series of slots here, and that these boards are then added when you add grain and removed as you take the grain out of the bins. On the outside of many granary doors, you see tally marks marks that show the farmer bringing uh, things in or taking things out and trying to keep account of what was going on. The other terminology that everyone who uh, studies old barns loves to throw out when they have conversations and presentations is the term uh, threshold, which is a vertical board, usually on either side, front or back, or of the threshing floor uh, that keep the threshings from uh, escaping out. And every day when we walk into any door, any house, the little bump we step over, we still call that the threshold. These are nice because they have these cleats for keeping the boards in place. And a lot of times when you get to the other boards, you, the barn has been changed and it's like a CSI kind of again, autopsy, you look at it and you try to figure things out um, by looking for um, different types of clues here. Show that there was a, um, you know, the door was here. That's the rabbits where the door was here. Again, as I said earlier, the window provides light into what was an enclosed room. You can see some of the mortises. You know, there's a lot of different signs that this was in fact uh, a barn that had a threshing floor in the center, uh, a granary to the left, and then boards separating them out from the threshing floor. Uh, use the term interchangeable. I should have used this slide much earlier. Uh, a bank barn is a barn that has an earthen embankment to allow wagon entry and exit to the second floor of a two-level barn. And they're... Uh, Completely really earthen. Um, they sometimes have stone sides. If a barn was built to the hillside, they take care of the net, they take into consider natural topography. And when the barn was built on flat ground, you would build the barn hill, barn hill, barn ramp, or bank. All the different names for that road leading up to the second floor level. And so, uh, a graphic showing what I just talked about: natural grade versus man-made grade. 
uh, whether you have stone abutment walls. Uh, then in later barns, the ramp doesn't go all the way to the barn itself, but there's a gap before the wall. And then that gap is either covered or rarely uncovered. And if it's covered, it's covered with a structure that we call a barn bridge because it is exactly the same as a covered bridge over a body of water, which is designed to protect the decking from um, snow and, and rain. So we have these and we call these bridge houses um, and often they literally have a gable roof and look like a small house or covered bridge. And here's an example of bridge bank barns. This one, the lower is a beautiful stone arch. This has just got, we used to have planks, which are, are now gone. And then an example of the shed roof bridge houses. And here are some gable roof bridge houses, uh, which again are just like covered bridges. Uh, we talk a little about plans. I don't know how much we have time to get into. We're, I, we're, I'm running long. I apologize. But there are obviously different plans for barns, and we talk about what they're used for, and therefore how they are laid out. And some of the features you see are stake mangers in older barns. Um, these mangers here uh, have a smaller bin for grain, a deeper bin for hay or such, and there are holes here for tethering the animals, the cows to the uh, stalls. Uh, and later on, of course, we have metal stanchions when you get into the, the 20th century that many people are uh, familiar with. Uh, there are a number of sources from James to Loudon to Star to different catalogs you can look at and you can find the, the precise names for these different features for when you are describing barns that have made it to this era of dairying. Again, there's some examples of them. And then we get into the generation of uh, modern or scientific barns um, as, you know, as compared to the uh, Older barns, which are much more vernacular and have less uh, continuity between them. And we do have some uh, standard features you see uh, on these. And of course, I think the one of the most obvious one is the introduction of the Gambrel roof. Um, these, you know, are relatively easy to identify, but using the right terminology is, is important. Uh, I just asked this question of the, my friends in Ohio a couple of weeks ago, so we just dropped it in here. Um, this is something we see throughout, uh, you know, mid-Atlantic, uh, and a lot of spiritual uh, reasons given for this, for witches and ghosts and goblins and such, but it seems to be um, some of the main reason is, as indicated here, the outline of barn doors. Um, so people could see them in, in limited light. That does not explain why you find them on second floor windows and such, but um, <laughs> a lot of it is for decoration. And then, you know, we have the Pennsylvania stars and flowers, um, often just known as heft signs as well. All right, so here we go. Um, did it in just over an hour. I apologize. We're supposed to leave some more time for, for questions. No, I think we we're right on. I think we, Danae started the introduction around 702. I, I think we're, we've dialed uh, this one. Anyway, if you want to get in touch with either of us to um, tell us uh, how wonderful this was or what we did wrong, I did one the other night and within two minutes I have somebody, here's a buzz kill and they tell me it was something I had done wrong. So uh, if you have, Pleasant things to say. Uh, my contact is below. If you have criticism, Michael's is above. That's entirely um, fair. Without belaboring it, are, are there any questions um, that we can answer? Thank you guys for sitting through that.
You did great. I think there is one question that I see in the chat uh, about, uh, hey, racks, as opposed, um, let's see, uh, if you can see that question there from, from, from R. Wilson. Um, this is where I wish we had Charles like on the call since he was very uh, well versed in, uh, in, in everything about hay lofts, hay mouths and, um, right. and, and doing that work. I've, I've not heard the term hay rack for a, something almost like a hay rick, some of that type of a word, but uh -huh. I'm not familiar with that. We did have a conversation recently about the open areas that we call hay drops or shoots to allow loose hay to go from, as we say in the vernacular, from, from mow to cow. So you can drop them down from the hay mow to the stable below. Uh, so I did see different terminology for that, but not hay rack. There is a question I see about the gable and barns in Pennsylvania. They are a later, traditionally later, and had to deal with um, more scientific barns. There, there are a small subset of actual four bay barns where the four bays are on the gable end, but they are anomalies. Um, and I often think of gable and barns as being uh, later barns as compared to the vernacular Pennsylvania bank barn. Yeah, and they were later generally in New England as well. Uh, the, basically, you wanted the, when people were threshing, you wanted the wind to whip through the barn. Um, so if you, you were trying to send the wind a long way to, through the barn, uh, it was kind of difficult. You needed a large, long, unobstructed hallway to work in, uh, to, to work effectively. So generally, for the purposes of threshing, uh, you had two large sets of doors on the eaves, uh, and then after a century or half a century of living in New England, people discovered that, you know, if you put the doors on the gable, then you don't have to deal with the snow. So eventually, that's where they went. In Oklahoma, um, most of the bank barns are gable and bank barns, but uh, I think those are generally derived from, uh, from Missouri and uh, in the Middle West, Indiana, maybe Kentucky. Um, so it's, it's kind of a weird phenomenon. But we also have a few side gabled uh, bank barns, mostly associated with the, with the Mennonites and the Amish, probably directly from Ohio. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see another question from John about the types of wood preferred for barn construction. Um, I would say that the primary types preferred are cheap and readily available with straight grain. Um, it varies over time. You, you see this uh, throughout settlement in New England. Uh, oak was a primary choice. If you were near coastal New England, uh, that was always the preferred wood. Uh, where I lived in northern Vermont, oak doesn't grow. And so up there, beech was sort of a, a primary source. Uh, as time went on and people had cleared the land and burned a lot of the good wood, they started moving into softwoods and secondary sources. Uh, so you'll find you know, eastern white pine all over the north uh, as a preferred material. And then basically as a result of deforestation and uh, surplus material from the tanning industries, hemlock comes around in the mid 19th century on the East Coast and becomes a dominant species. Not because it's good wood, it's because it was what was cheap and what was available. Uh, and I've seen that a lot where you really do end up with barns that are a mix of woods. Uh, there's some mythology about white oak being this dogmatic material, you know, that, that people were very dogmatic about using only white oak and doing uh, dendrochronology sampling uh, through analysis, we've discovered that there was a lot of red oak in those early structures. And one of the things that I had considered is that when people were coming to the new world, uh, they had no knowledge of the trees that were here. They saw what sort of looked like things that they knew from where they came from and they had to learn by trial and error what woods are good and what woods aren't good. 
so I've seen some experimental things. I've seen knee braces made out of witch hazel. Uh, I've seen black walnut used. I've seen sycamore used. That didn't go well. <laughs> yeah. I also see a question here about uh, to, uh, K, uh, beams that bear the name of a barn builder. That That is rare, but not uncommon in Pennsylvania. Uh, we see a lot of 18th century barns. Michael and I were at a barn in northern Montgomery County that had a you know, mid 18th century date on a beam right above the threshing floor. There's several similar to that throughout Montgomery County, which is the county just west of Bucks County and north of Philadelphia. Um, so those are fairly rare. Um, and the next question is, uh, have you encountered many house barns in the U.S.? I have not. They are here. Uh, there's not a lot, but a friend of mine from, there's a, a group, the Traditional Timber Framers Research and Advisory Group, uh, and a fellow, John McNamara, had done a restoration to a small Bernhoff, a little barn house in New York, just north of the Pennsylvania border. So he, he kind of blew us all away when he showed it to us, but it was very clear that that's what this was. Uh, and it was very well documented. It, it was actually built in the 1840s. The person had sort of come over and come right off the boat and that's what he knew and that's what he built. It's not common, uh, certainly not in New England, uh, nor in the Mid-Atlantic. I think it was rare enough that in this, uh, there were, I just sent out to people in Pennsylvania a, a reference in the 1798 federal direct tax where the tax assessor noted that someone was living in the barn. So. Uh, it must have been rare for him to note that on the, the tax record. So I think they were pretty rare. Oh, Although I, you could you could also bring into that conversation the big house, little house, back house, barn concept, which runs up through New England, uh, which is a connected architecture that has a barn. It is still a separate barn, but the house is literally connected to it along with other structures. And by the way, that is the name of the book, Big House, Little Big House, House, Back House Barn. But if you look at the, the, the progression, they often show that, you know, in the first settlement, they're separate. Correct. Uh, and the structures, you know, sort of fill in and then we get insurance companies and they say, I think you can separate <laughs> that. And so they start moving apart again. Michael, there's a question about, Pens oh, I'm sorry, New World Dutch Barns. you want to? I am looking for the question. Okay. I'm scrolling. I actually just made a reply to it uh, and tried to include a link from, uh, I guess they are now the, Hus the Hudson um, Valley Vernacular Architecture Group, but that was part of the Dutch Barn Preservation Society. And um, there's also a, a good book there uh, on, on Dutch barns. I, it was John Fitchin, I believe. I just tried to John Google Fitchin really quick to confirm. And Jonathan Stevens. Fitchin wrote one and Stevens wrote one. Okay. They're, they're both excellent. Um, the major characteristic construction wise is, uh, is they are gable entry, a wide threshing floor uh, that is usually referred to the nave and it is often referred to as a nave and aisles plan. It may have, um, it might have two aisles, it might have one. Usually they, they are symmetrical. Uh, they are on, not even on occasion, they are often wider than they are long. That sounds funny. But that wide gable end, you know, maybe 44 feet or 46 feet, uh, and the barn itself in, in length along the eaves might only be 40. Uh, we, we see that periodically. I think one of the really defining features, the thing that people look for, are in the, the center of the barn, what defines the nave, are substantial posts that go uh, from the, the floor or the sill level all the way up to the purlin plates. And then they have what they call an anchor beam or anchor block in, uh, in the center. But the, the link that Janae sent to the, uh, oh, they changed their name. It used to be historic yes. Hudson Valley Vernacular Architecture Association or something like that. But a uh, wonderful group and lots of resources. They can tell you all you'd ever need to know about Dutch barns. If, if I may jump in, there is one small complication to this and that is that the writer of the question comes from the Holland area of Michigan, which discusses there, they promote the idea that the barns there have a connection to Dutch construction. 
and it gets a little bit complicated, of course, because the Dutch that settled the Hudson River Valley are the unorganized Deutsch people of all of Northern Europe. And the Dutch people that settled Holland, Michigan are from Holland. And by that time, their construction was very different. And the Dutch barns that we find in the Hudson River Valley are not at all the same barns that we find in Western Michigan. I can, I can echo that. There is, uh, there's a, a little pocket of um, Dutch influenced architecture in central Kentucky and Mercer County, Kentucky as well. And I know there was a thesis uh, written about that um, with the anchor beam and some other materials there, but it had definitely, it had been enough time for the settlers that came that way. I know that they had, there was evidence of some other influence along, along their journey, but, um, but clearly some characteristics stayed out. So, Right. There's always going to be, not always, I hope there still is, you know, uh, good variations that, that make the studies that we do worthwhile. <laughs> I, I wanted to throw in something from California, which is completely uh, Auslander from the discussion. But um, we have, because we got into barn building, you know, two centuries after everybody else did, basically, um, we have what we call a basilica barn, which is typically wider than deep. And it is a three bay situation. And uh, that's, that's kind of our standard. In fact, we, it's sometimes just called the California barn. Oh, cool. Uh, I uh, wanted to answer some of the other questions that were written there before they, they get forgotten. I see uh, Mike asks, does post and beam refer to building with metal fasteners as well as mortise and tenon and pegs? I would say to uh, somebody writing an ad for uh, real estate, probably for anybody that makes their living swinging a mallet at a chisel, no. Uh, timber framers do not refer to their work as post and beam. If you're cutting joints, that, that's a, a different animal altogether. And there's a lot of hybridization, uh, and especially when you get into the West Coast and Pacific Northwest, uh, just because of seismic uh, requirements for code, uh, there is a requirement that even if you're using joinery, that in certain situations, you really need to have metal fasteners there as well. Uh, so there is some hybridizing and m maybe there's a different feeling about it on the West Coast, but uh, generally no, post and beam is, is metal plates. Um, somebody asked, uh, can we share a recording of this? And I imagine that Danae is going to post uh, the recording of the session to YouTube. I have been recording it. Right. That's the goal. Yep. And, and we are hoping that Michael and I were the first board members of the NBA to do this, that uh, people from other regions of the NBA will step up. And so the issues that people have brought some questions about other parts of the country that we did not cover, uh, hopefully will get addressed. We are throwing the gauntlet down to <laughs> those barn... Right people and they don't have to be NBA board members. They can be what we like to refer to as future NBA board members. <laughs> wanna, yeah, I um, think I heard somebody volunteer to do a presentation. Volunteer to do these presentations. So please, this was supposed to be just to start the conversation, not to tell everybody everything there is to know about barns. Jeff, I see uh, there, there's a question here. Are four bays always in the front of the barn and banks on the back of the barn? Uh, you you might get into the fore and aft discussion. That's that's the terminology that makes it. But as with everything, you can't say always. And there are some gable end four bay barns. Very rare, but there are some. And uh, you know, again, if the, if it is, if it is a overhanging extension and it's not on the front of the barn, it, you know, there are other terms for them when you read the 19th century literature, such as abutment houses or bank sheds and such. But the rule of thumb is the four bay is the front of the barn because the four bay protects the barnyard and the barnyard was the front of the barn. I, I see, I'm just, I'm scrolling back. I'm trying to hit everybody's questions. And I noticed that um, Tom wrote in uh, that he had read somewhere that Gable End barns were called Welsh barns. And I wanted to throw out a, a, a nugget of wisdom from Cynthia Falk, who has written some very interesting things on Barnes in New York and Pennsylvania German material culture. Uh, and she had essentially asserted that after about 1750, 
everything here is American. There are no German barns. There are no English barns. Um, there are, you know, it's a polyglot community. People take the best traits of things that they see and they, they amalgamate. When we talk about English threshing barns in New England that are everywhere up there, uh, I work with somebody in Oxford and I've discussed this with him a lot and I said, is this a common standard barn? And his answer is no. Uh, so uh, generally, it, it doesn't mean that there aren't uh, influences from various places in Europe, but I really, it, it, with the exception of the New World Dutch frames, I avoid uh, ascribing uh, a culture specifically to a, a type of frame design. I think Jeff did a good job of illustrating where you, you may have uh, a German family using uh, or having constructed an English Lake District barn. And there's also number of examples that where you, if you see large scale photography, uh, you can see various styles of barns in the same neighborhood. Um, an English Lake District barn next to a Schweitzer barn next to a standard barn. Um, and it's, as, as you said, um, I like the term creolization, you know, uh, taking something from another culture and making it your own is what we have here in, in uh, America. I see another question. Are, are barn quilts common in the northeastern U.S.? New York, maybe. New England, not so much. Jeff? No, I, uh, that's a, a very recent phenomenon. And um, New Jersey, I know uh, certain counties would, would publicize that as a way to call attention to their rural heritage. But as a rule, no, they're not that common. I will also say, I just sent it, I realized the message went back, but um, do you have a minute to talk about um, National Register Evaluation and Criteria C as they apply for Barnes? I know that was something that was in our keywords Then I feel like we might not have um, spoken on too much yet. Well, it, and I'll say it briefly, um, because as most people know, the National Register is administered by each state historic preservation office, it's hard to speak globally. We in Pennsylvania have a, you know, Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission, and we are working with them to change their philosophy on barns. Uh, I think traditionally they would look at barns as um, emblematic of the farm and agriculture, and we're very concerned with census records and status and uh, census records and things like that, and almost ignored the uh, architectural and or aesthetic features of barns, and we're trying to get them to change that, so. Um, I will add that they came to us. Yes. The, the State Historic Preservation Office is, is, is very progressive. They're very concerned and they really solicited uh, input and insight from a, a wide ar array of historians and craftspeople. But what seems to be the, the biggest obstacle that we've been discussing in the past few years is context. Um, and that barns in isolation are right. very difficult to independently nominate. But Jeff, didn't we see two nominated in PA this year? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we've come up with a, a romantic term of remnant barn for a barn that has lost its agricultural context, but because of its individual craftsmanship, artistry, size, or some other feature, it should be recognized as significant. But back to the point is that, you know, when you talk about barn, integrity is also very tough because barns that are still being used have often been altered to make them functional from metal siding, metal roofs, uh, accretions and such. And, you know, how do you weigh that against the, um, the framing and in the interior that most people don't, you know, don't get a chance to see. So it, it's a tough issue because of context, integrity, uh, and significance. Um, you know, it's almost as if you have to have a generic um, representative of a type of architecture, because most barns are not individually significant, but collectively they obviously are important in, in um, identifying the rural landscape. So it, it's an issue that I don't think we're completely comfortable with. And again, Pennsylvania is a barn rich state and we hopefully will come up with something in the next year or so that others can see. 
Uh, I think Pennsylvania has one of the better contexts to evaluate, and certainly you've preserved a lot of archival records that I know a lot of other states do not have the benefit of. We don't always have the tax records and the things that really provide a lot of insight. But um, but yes, I will certainly echo the idea of, of the lack of a context. And I, I think as well that the uh, the the National Register uh, Technical Bulletin for Evaluating R Rural Landscapes did note that change in a barn and continuity over time doesn't necessarily right, mean that um, that it's lost integrity. If it continued to still function in agricultural purpose and usage, then that shows, you know, its evolution within the same field. Um, as opposed to, you know, yes, clearing it, gutting it, and making, you know, a, a party barn or something, um, which is fine too. <laughs> Just saying that's uh, one way to also put, put a... Um, an idea uh, of a threshold for integrity on it. Jeff, we also now I see a question about um, MPD nominations or thematic nominations. And I think there recently was a discussion with the state about this. I brought, we brought that up at our, our last meeting and uh, in Pennsylvania, it's gotten to the point where what used to be called thematic nominations, now multiple properties, you almost have to do the same level of documentation on each of the individual members then you know so it's, it's a little bit tougher than they used to be but and we are trying to come up for the state what does a barn need to have to, to maintain its barnness to use the term we just made up um, and to make it you know worthy of preservation uh, you know and that's you know it's very difficult because they were adapted and they were designed to be adapted for different uses well, I think all of this has been wonderful, and I don't um, want us to, I know we could all talk for a long time when we get into our, our certain our geek elements, but um, as, as um, has been said um, in, in the email, I will put this recording um, on our YouTube, and I certainly encourage further comments and discussion there, and of course, we look forward to hosting a few more of these lectures, um, and would love to include things and perspectives from elsewhere in the country. So uh, everyone will receive a follow-up email, and, uh, and I hope you do stay in touch with us about it. We're also, of course, open to to other suggestions and any other uh, uh, people who would be willing to put out um, their assessments and findings from different parts of the country. Uh, we, we want to, to continue to be a part of that conversation and, and do our best to help lead it um, uh, if we can as, as, as barns become indeed a, a, a bit more rare on our landscape. So um, again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Jeff and Michael for giving your time and expertise and um, we look forward to the next one, I guess.